She said, Jillian, you don't believe this. I just posted a job for marketing manager today. Today? Today! Oh! What's up, everybody? My name is Adam, and I'm the host of the You Know Adam Same podcast, the show that is dedicated on bringing on passionate people, learning about their stories, and delivering value to entrepreneurs. So if that's what you're interested in, go ahead and follow, like, and subscribe. You know what I'm saying? How's it going, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the You Know Adam Same podcast, where you get to know just a little bit more about people, passions, and all things business. Today, sitting across the way, I have Miss Jenny Lynn Anderson. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yes, and you are the owner and founder of Buzz Marketing, and uh, super excited to talk about, uh, this is actually one of the first times that I've had the opportunity and pleasure of interviewing somebody, somebody that's in the PR field. <gasps> so super excited about that. Uh, but for the audience that has never met you before, let's get a little bit of about who you are. Okay. Well, Adam, first I want to say thank you for having me here today. I noticed that you always wear black, so I, I dressed in black as well. Thank you. And not only I did that, I put on my push-up bra. Okay. I'm really nice, looking good. Nice. Thank you. Pop you in. <laughs> well, as much as I can at the age of 59. I love that. But you look phenomenal. Thank you. I appreciate it. But Absolutely. anyway, yeah, I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. I'm, um, I'm, um, a lot of people know me from Statesboro. I'm from here. I yeah. was raised and born here in Bullock County. Amazing. Uh, went to Georgia Southern, studied public relations, and then went to Atlanta in 1985 to, you know, get that first job. Got you. And how was that? Awesome. Yes. Um, I went to Atlanta in 1985 as an intern at Lockheed. Okay. So I had... Impressive. That's, yeah. a, that's not an easy task to do. No, it was hard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't know anything about military aircraft. Uh -huh. I faked it the uh -huh. whole time. <laughs> okay. I have to say I was not interested. Uh -huh. But it was, a, it was an interesting internship because it was um, good on paper. Mm -hmm. And that's really why I did it. Sure. And um, out the gate, I went and um, I can remember being 21 years old looking for my first job and my parents here in Statesboro saying, hey, how's the job search going? Uh -huh. And I was trying so hard. I uh -huh. mean, I remember sending out 99 resumes by mail. Wow. I had the list of Public Relations Society of America, George okay. Chapter, and I, I got a lot of, you know, interviews, but it Ultimately, I ended up getting a job at the Georgia World Congress Center as a PR assistant. Wow. Mm -hmm. And how was that experience? Oh, it was the most awesome thing that could have ever happened to me when yep. I was young. Mm -hmm. You know, the Georgia World Congress Center at that time was one of the largest trade show and convention facilities in the country. Yes. Um, I was in the PR department where we got to liaise with all of the media who came to cover every convention and trade show. Okay. And so my job was to write newsletters, take photos, interview people for internal newsletters of the Georgia World Congress Center for Employees. So I was doing employee newsletters and also external newsletters. Got you. And I was also um, the spokesperson sometimes, even though I was young. Um, I was the one who, you know, if something happened there at the Congress Center, they would get us on tape like this, and we would talk about whatever was happening at the Congress Center. Okay. And I became the PR manager there. My wow. supervisor left. How many years over, like, this period of time? This was uh, six years. Okay. That you worked at this? Okay. Mm -hmm, at the Congress Center. Uh-huh. And then in 1990, I had an opportunity to come back here to Statesboro to be PR director for Willingway Hospital, okay. which is a nationally renowned alcohol and drug treatment facility. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. What made you, so like, what was it that you missed home? Was that part of it? Or what, what kind of like ultimately brought you back? Because yeah. everybody thinks uh, like the, the trend yes. for, for a small town kind of like university is yes. once, once you're done, head out, right? Yes. Um, so what kind of like brought you back? Well, my husband, Mark, and I at that time were both from Statesboro and Bullock County. And, you know, we had both been raised here and we both had wonderful careers up there, but we couldn't quite figure out how do you do ch children? Mm. You know, I, I kept looking around. We were living in West Cobb. I was traveling every day downtown, 40 minutes away. And I just couldn't wrap my mind around how we were going to raise children up there because it was sort of contrary to what I had been used to here in South Georgia. So we made the decision to come back to Statesboro. We both got wonderful career opportunities back here, and we came back in 1990. Yeah. And mm -hmm. how? what did uh, Statesboro look like during that period of time? Mm -hmm. Do you remember? Of course so. 
Um, it was, you know, much smaller. Georgia Southern, when I graduated, was, um, I finished in 85. We had about 6,000 students mm-hmm. in 1985. Okay. And so Statesboro in and of itself was, you know, we had some manufacturing here like Grinnell. I don't know if you know any of those mm-hmm. old names, but there was some manufacturing here. But basically, it was still pretty rural a lot of agriculture. And of course, you know, the um, hospital was a huge employer at that time. Walmart had not come yet. And these other, some of these other big box and more, you know, nationally branded companies had not made it to town yet. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, it was smaller, but yet still close enough to Savannah. And of course, we had lived in Atlanta and we loved the big city. That's right. And so I always had, we had opportunities to always go back to Atlanta and go to Savannah. And, That's right. You know, we enjoyed traveling. You know, so I connect with that story because, you know, I was living out in LA for a period of time. Yes. And while I was out in LA, you know, there was an opportunity to come back home. Yes. And, you know, people look at me funny, right? Like they're like, you made it out of Statesboro. What are you doing back here? Right. That's <laughs> that's the question that I get every single time. But there's something unique about this community, uh, especially growing up in it, mm-hmm. that it, I, I don't think it can be replicated anywhere no. else. I wanted to raise children here. That's right. And I was at that time um, 28 years old. OK. And I knew that I needed I wanted to come back home. I had my mom and dad here. Um, our families, big families here mm-hmm. in Bullock County and um, nearby. That's and right. I knew I wanted to come back. And I had an opportunity with Willing Way to do my love, my yes, craft, my that's discipline. Right. That's right. And did it on a national level mm-hmm. and even internationally because we wow. brought patients in from all over the world uh-huh. to Willing Way. Gotcha. So it was a, an, um, a very unique opportunity to work in PR right here in this small town. That's amazing. Yeah. What, what kind of uh, – what's in the next part of that story, right? When do you get to the point where you start to do your own, right? Like that's kind of like, you know, this – channel is really meant yeah. for entrepreneurs yes. and having you know industry experience is absolutely valuable yes. right like even for me uh going to various different companies seeing the inside of how they work yes. growing with those companies is always like kind of like the backbone that i mm-hmm. you know rest my hat on for you kind of like at what point do you start to kind of like look at marketing as something buzz marketing yes yes yeah. well um it organically happened within a year or so of us coming back to Statesboro, there was an opportunity um, to be a part of something here in Statesboro that Mark and I were involved with. And Mm -hmm. what happened was, it was 19, it was about 1990, 1991, we had just come back here. And we, um, at that time, we had a lot of friends and there was this thought that uh, some friends of ours said, you know, we know this guy and he wants to create a locally owned funeral home here in town. Okay. And what had happened was the funeral home that had been in existence here had been bought out by one of the corporate giants. Oh, understood. So these, um, this group of people came to us and they said, you know, we think there is a need for a locally owned funeral home. And Mark and I both were like, yeah, we think that too. Mm-hmm. So we were one of the initial investors in what was called Joiner Shepherd Funeral Home. I know this one. Okay. So yes. then the shepherd, he ended up not making it. He went back home to Alabama, but we were building this Joiner Shepherd Funeral Home, which became Joiner Anderson Funeral understood. Home. Understood. Understood. But that is where the entrepreneurial bug started and we just like we went we went um just i hate to say hog wild but you know it respectful i want to be very respectful funeral home business and industry Mm -hmm. it is a unique industry you have to always remember that people are at one of the hardest times in their life when they come to you that's right however it's still a business that's right and we felt like we could do this business a little better a little differently think outside of the box, use um, use things like, for instance, just customer service. When we first started out and we created Joiner Shepherd, Joiner Anderson, you know, we were looking for opportunities to serve the clients, serve the families in a different way. Well, I mean, I can remember the days in which Mark and Tracy, that's Tracy Joiner, we would, um, it would be night and it would be visitation and it'd be flooding outside. Oh, they ended up parking cars for people, wow. concierge service. Wow. So we were thinking we took industry you know, standards outside of the funeral home business, and we 
had been in corporate work. We had been to Atlanta. We knew what kind of service could be given, and we really delved into that. And, you know, at the time, though, you're young and stupid, right? Okay. And so we were young and stupid. Okay. The fact that we tried to do this, the funeral home that we ended up competing against had been in our community for centuries. Wow. You know, it had been here for, not centuries, it had been here for a century. Mm-hmm. And so, but when you're young and dumb, you think, we can do that. <laughs> you know, well, it's hard because, you know, funeral homes, like a lot of different kind of businesses, are entrenched in tradition, steeped in tradition, steeped in, in relationships. And so basically, you know, knowing what I know now, it was a huge leap of faith that we took. Mm -hmm. And so Mark and I invested along with another set of people, and we invested a total of a million dollars in Joyner Shepherd Funeral Home. Wow. Wow. So you know what I became. Do do you remember that moment? Because I, I think that this is a common thing with a lot of entrepreneurs. Yeah. Because we plan, 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 plan. But then there's that moment that you have to take that leap of faith to mm-hmm. say, hey, I've done all the research. I've done everything. Yes. And then go for it. Yes. You remember that moment in time? I remember that moment in time. Mark and I were living in our home in Georgian Walk. I remember we were both Christians. I remember we got on the floor together in the den and we prayed to God. We asked God to give us, you know, just the wisdom to do what we were about to do because this was a lot of money. We were young Mm. and we were investing $100,000 into this. And um, I remember we got down on our knees in the den and prayed together and said, Lord, just please watch over us as we do this. Guide us, protect us, you know, bless us. Mm Mm-hmm. Bless us. Mm-hmm. Just please take care of us, Lord, because yes. we're we're young and dumb. And we knew it was a big leap. But you know what? Our intuition was correct. Yeah. And that is where, you know, back then I was working full time at Willing Way. Uh-huh. And so I'll never forget the day we had the groundbreaking at Joyner Anderson. I borrowed the lectern from Willing Way Hospital. It was a beautiful mahogany one that we had in meeting room three. Okay. I said, Jimmy Mooney, we're about to do that groundbreaking. Can I have that lectern? I got to have it. We got to put it out there in that field. Uh-huh. And so, you know, we're dragging it in a truck, <laughs> put it out there. But, you know, at that moment, I became the PR director leading up to all that because I was the only one who had that skill set, mm-hmm. marketing and PR. We had accountants on in the group. Uh-huh. M- Mark was a business-minded man, with a, great with numbers. Mm-hmm. I had the creative PR marketing deal going on, and it was just magic. Yes. A lot of magic great happening. Great team. Great team. Mark yes. and I made a great team. That's awesome. Yeah. What uh, in your, because you've been entrenched in PR for this period of time. Yeah. How have you seen... PR change over time? I think is relatively the same. Mm. What has changed is the multitude of platforms in which we can share the message. Got you. Right? So the message is actually still all yes. the, okay. The discipline is exactly the same. And to you, what is that discipline? I think it is to be able to work with the business in which you're you know, consulting for. I think the main job is to listen. Mm. And then to really pay attention to what the obstacles and problems are within a business. And then take that and try to message, you know, try in your best ability to create the messaging that best aligns to the brand. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So you've got to know something about the brand, but then you've got to be able to take those words, phrases, be able to brand it in such a way that's consistent mm-hmm. and then take that branding, take that messaging and then deliver it to the audiences that need to hear your message. Mm. Like with funeral homes, young people aren't interested in funerals, sure, but you know who are. It is the person who's over the age of 40. That's right. It is the age, you know, especially in your 50s, especially in your 60s, 70s, 80s. But you have to find the target audiences and you have to find the right common thread of information that you're going to consistently deliver to them mm-hmm. over and over again in different different um you know different channels yes so the channels when i was growing up it was abc <laughs> cbs nbc and pbs sure we had the antenna on top of the house in the 60s that's right and you had some time to 
crawl up to the, you know, crawl Move up. It. And you had to sh- adjust the antenna, <laughs> right? Yeah. Then, you know, you go into the next phase where you had more TV channels. Cable came sure. along. And then you still always had radio, mm-hmm. radio, radio, radio. And then billboards were always in existence, sure. right? That's and right. then you had what else? You had those regulars. And then oh, in 1990, I can remember, you know, then fax machines came. Yeah. I can remember sending press releases out by mail. Really? Oh, and the day the fax machine started at the Congress Center, uh-huh. I was like, oh, I'm efficient. <laughs> I am like, man, getting these press releases out on the fax machine. Yeah. <laughs> so doing that. And then f- from the fax machine, I can remember the first day I had a computer in front of me at the at the Congress Center. Uh-huh. And we had Word Perfect. Uh-huh. And like, we didn't know what any of this was. Yes. And then I remember the day that I was introduced to the World Wide Web at Willingway Hospital in 1991. Mm. And it was going, you know, that noise that you hear on the dial up. Uh I'm not good with noises. That's all right. Could you do that for me? No, I I don't have that one. It's like, uh, I'd have to look it up, but it was just that that sort of ring tone. That's right. And then you hear it going, and it's like, oh, I'm connecting. I'm connecting. And then you were like, I thought, you can see, you can find any information you'll ever want to know on this thing. <laughs> and I also remember they told us at Willingway you couldn't use it very much. Why? Oh, it, too it, expensive. It was too expensive. Oh. You only had a little bits of time. That's right. So we all had to like really, you know, be conservative. Like I was scared to death to go over any time because I didn't have any mi- mindset about like what this was costing the Mooney yeah. family at Willingway, but I knew it was expensive. Gotcha. So I was like, but I was just hungering. Yeah. I hungered for that knowledge. Yes. I remember wanting to just hog it. I wanted to cheat. I wanted to lie still. <laughs> I wanted just to like just take all that time that I could get, but I didn't. The, I was very cognizant of the fact that it was expensive. That is so important as an entrepreneur. Yes. That that you know even if. Y- Money isn't always available or, you know, but you have to find a way to get the job done and you have to be efficient in that. And that's what I hear there is like, you know, just this hunger of technology as it's coming in. Yes. I'm going to hop on it. I'm going to kind of like right. understand. I'm going to learn. Yes. That served you. Yes. Extremely well. And then from there, of course, after the web, after we got all of us started, you know, going on the web, then, of course, web based platforms and technology has further complicated our world. Yes. And I mean, in terms of that, I just mean the noise. Sure. There's so many channels now, platforms, channels, that it's often harder, I think it's much harder, to cut through that noise and find people who will listen to you and who want to hear your message and just um, get them to pay attention. Mm -hmm. So, man, our jobs are harder now. That's right. Harder and harder and harder. That's you got to right. work smarter. Uh, you know, I, I think in here, uh, oftentimes we hear about like the strategies and things that uh, lead us to be able to be successful entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. But there's also challenges along the way. Yes. Uh, oftentimes, you know, in the form of just, you know, uh, being stretched too thin or, you know, other things that might come in. What were some of the challenges that you faced as a entrepreneur? In your journey, um, I think that my life, if you know it, and, and I'm very, I'm very open about my life's challenges. Mm. I wrote a book several years ago, but for my life, I'm 59 years old, mm-hmm. born in 1963. I'm a baby boomer. Okay, I have fortunately, and I don't know about you, but for my life in 59 years, I've had three major life quakes. Mm. What do you define as a life quake? Oh man, they are a uh, they are something. It's like a tsunami, mm. and it hits you, and the you know it's just such huge. It's like a huge earthquake that happens. It's not just a little bump in the road, mm-hmm. but I've had some life quakes in mm-hmm. which the scale was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. My first one, and I don't mind sharing them, but I think from each of these, I have found that every obstacle, every life quake that came in my life. The obstacle was followed by a great opportunity beyond anything I could ever imagine. So my first obstacle happened in 1990, the year I came back here to work at Willingway Hospital. Mm. And um, what happened was I was actually, ironically, back in Atlanta at a convention and trade show representing Willingway. Okay. It was at a convention called CCAD, Southeastern Conference on Alcohol and Drugs. Okay. And um, I was there with my team of marketing people. And um, the day that we had gotten off the trade show floor, 
I was so excited. Um, I was taking an editor out for dinner to pitch some story ideas to him, and he was in the national realm sure. in alcohol and drug treatment. So my marketing director and I were going out to dinner with him, and um, we all went back up to our, We were in a hotel, downtown Atlanta hotel, huge hotel. We just ran back up to our rooms, got on the elevators. You know, we'll meet back in the lobby 15 minutes, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, I never made it. You never got... This happened. Mm. Room, Room 939. 939. Okay. So that happened. My room was room 939. The hotel we were staying at, my hotel room was at the very end of the hall on the right. Mm -hmm. Long hallway. Okay. In fact, when I went back to do research for my book, I found out the the hallway in this hotel is over a football field long. Wow. Long. From, huge. From where the... Elevator. Okay. Wow. All the way down. I measured it. Okay. Anyway, I go to my room, put my lipstick on, brush my teeth. I was heading back out the door. I mean, we were sort of in a rush. Coming back out the door, swung that pocketbook over my shoulder, and I was just walking down the hallway, and I see this man approaching me, and I didn't think anything. Well, all of a sudden, he, like, lurched over to my side of the hallway, attacked me, and Adam, I got to tell you, this is who I was. I was 28 years old, mm. and this is who I was. The minute he came and attacked me, I just thought, you got to be kidding me. Mm. I'm on my way to a meeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was like, and I, I had been really athletic growing up. Okay. I played sports all over. So, um, and he was not that tall. He was like five foot ten. Okay. And I, I, I like fought him. Yeah. Well, I fought him and I fought him. I screamed. I screamed. Wow. And um, he ended up like getting a knife out. He has the knife to my neck and he's like, you don't shut up. I'm going to kill you. Wow. And there starts the death march back to room 939. Oh, my goodness. So I was within probably 10 feet of the door, but he pushed me back against the door. People came out of their hotel rooms. They heard me. They did hear. They did. And the only thing, only thing one person saw was a, a black leather jacket, his leather jacket. He had me against the door. Knife to my neck, saying, put the card in. Mm. Somebody saw that jacket go into the door. That's all they That's saw. That's all they saw. So I was inside that room. He yanked the, back there, back then, there weren't any cell phones. This was 1990. He yanked the phone jack out of the wall, and he told me he was going to rape me. Oh and then he said, uh, um, give me your money. Well, he robbed me first. He robbed me of all my money. He robbed me of my jewelry. He um, and and there was something that's so interesting. What we do, what we do in these states of emergency. But I had my wedding ring on, and I remember thinking, he's not gonna get my ring. Mm. And and um, I remember I was taking my necklace off, but while doing so, I twisted my diamond under. Uh, so he wouldn't see, see it. it. Uh -huh. And I tried hard not to bring this hand up. I mean, what the heck? What am, you know, like, what is it that I'm doing? But I'm doing it. I'm like, he's not getting my wedding ring. Yeah. So he takes my jewelry. He's, you know, grabs it. He whatever's. And he's, and then he's like, take your clothes off. Well, you know what you do. Mm. I, as a woman, did what you're not supposed to do. I mean, I didn't know the rules. Sure. But, of course, I begged him not to do it. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to do this. No, I don't want to do this. And, of course, he made me take my clothes off. Well, all the while this is happening, I was just thinking, how can I? I mean, I'm on the bed. There's two, two, two queen beds. The door is right over there. It's right there. It's there. And I'm here on this bed. And I'm thinking, how many feet am I away from that door? And how can I get out of this room? Oh. Well, he, you know... He ended up um, uh, sexually assaulting me, and while he is doing it, he, he gets up one time, and he goes to the bathroom and gets a washcloth, and like Adam, I was like, what's that for? Yeah. Like, what was it? And I knew then, I was like, Jen Lynn, he's about to kill you. Yeah. Like, you got to get it in gear here, and the only thing I thought was, I was like, okay, here I go. I used every persuasive thing I'd ever learned at Georgia Southern in uh. my classes. And I said to him, I was like, I'm going to trick him. And I said, 
my marketing director is about to come back any minute. He's mm-hmm. going to find you here. Uh-huh. And then I was like, don't. I was like, I think I hear him. And I, I paused. And I, I mean, I may put on the greatest act of my life. And I talked to him. And I was just like, he's going to find you here. He's coming back. We're about to go to a meeting. He's about to find you. Yeah. And I said, D- D- he's he's coming. Yeah. Man, I mean, I was like, dude, you better, you better get your acting gear because he's about to come back here. Well, he got hesitant. He got up off the bed. He went to the door. He cracked the door open that much. And no lie, Adam, my eyes met the eyes of a housekeeper in the hallway. And I just screamed, he's raving me. He's going to kill me. And like I screamed and I screamed and I screamed. The man ran out the door past the housekeeper down the emergency staircase because, you know, there's always one at the end of a hallway. That's right. They never found him. They never found him. Never found Were him. Were there uh, cameras at this point? No. Any? Yes. They have it. No. They didn't get it. No. You know, sometimes places have cameras, but they don't work. <sighs> yeah. So, Adam, that was life quake number one. I, I was actually, I guess the word is scared to death. Like, scared to death. Think about that expression. That event scared me that I sort of lost my life. I came, number one, I'd been so confident all my life. But something like that, so traumatic. Sure. That even if you're a strong human being and one who's loved by family like I was, it's a lot to take in. And when he left and I was inside that room, it was just a long journey, and when my mother and Mark came to get me the next day in Atlanta, I was not even the same person I had was when I went to that business conference. Yeah. And um, I just remember— I'm, I'm sure there's, like, trauma, right? Trauma. Like, post-traumatic stress disorder is what happens. Mm. And so I ended up coming back home. You can read my book, but, you know, it's like— you come back home, and it's like he, he, it's almost like you, 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 you're changed, but you look the same. And then a lot of times I just wanted to say, you know, there, there was no physical evidence, That's right? right? That's right. But there's these emotional scars. But you won't almost say, you, you wanted to go to people and say, you see, this is where he cut me. That's right. But there was nothing other than that I was just a shell of Jenny Lynn Anderson. Mm. But, you know, that happened on a Thursday night. I was back at work on Monday. Wow. How did you find the strength to do that? Right? Because, you know, when, when someone goes through something as traumatic as this, because I, I cannot even imagine. Like, Me either. Like, literally, I'm speechless, right? Yeah. Where did, how did you find the courage to continue on? I really think that... It's just something that's in a person. I had been raised by my mother, Faye Sanders Martin, who's a judge. Mm. She was strong. I think it runs in our family. And my mother had been very strong growing up. And she was the first woman lawyer here in Bullock County and the first superior court judge, woman judge in Georgia, to be appointed by a governor. Mm. So I had watched her. Mm -hmm. And like I had... I have some of that in me, Mm -hmm. and I've also got resilience in me. Mm -hmm. So, like, but Adam, it was ugly. Mm -hmm. This this journey to healing, it took me. My book is Room Nine Three Nine. Fifteen minutes of horror, twenty years of healing. It took me twenty years before I got to the point where I wrote this book. It took me twenty years to finally give it up and finally say I need help with counseling. So, how how long did like you, because I imagine you just suppressed it. I suppressed. I would do, I went along with my life. Sure. We did everything. Mm-hmm. I had two children. We ran funeral homes. Yeah. We did everything. Didn't, but, didn't, like you couldn't miss a beat there. No, but I didn't miss a beat. But what I didn't do was I didn't want to take the band aid off because yeah. I thought taking the band aid off of this wound would really be harder than just leaving it in place. And so, you know, my family, my sister specifically would come to me every now and then and say, Jenna Lynn, 
you really need help because I was having post-traumatic stress disorder. What, how, how, what, did, what would that show up as? Well, hyperventilation, panic attacks. Um, when Mark would come home at night or, or when we would, you know, I would go to sleep maybe earlier than he, he would come into the bedroom. I would think he was the perpetrator. I would scream at him, yell at him. I was, you know, go berserk. That happened for 20 years, wow. Adam. But I wouldn't go to help. I wouldn't go get help, though, because I really thought I was handling it okay. And you do. You do the best you can, and you do go on with your life, but it's unresolved. Yeah. It was still unresolved. Well, there was finally an incident when Mark came in the room one night, and I went to berserk and whatever, and usually I would wake up. He would, you know, rouse me where he'd say, Jen Lynn, it's me. And I'd go... And, you know, I remember thinking always there was just this grief of, oh, it's like I'm doing this again. And I'd go back to sleep. Well, that night, nothing happened. And the next morning, I woke up and I remember saying to him, hey, you know, I, oh, I slept great last night. Did you sleep well? And he looked at me and he said, Jen you don't remember what happened last night? Wow. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, you're crazy. He said, you went crazy, uh, worse than normal crazy. And so I said, well... What did I do? He said, well, Jillian, you were just yelling and screaming at me and jumping out of the bed. And, um, you know, I had no recollection of it, Adam. So that post-trauma was getting worse. It was getting deeper. So I was like, okay, I think I need some help. You think? <laughs> so I went to a lady named Ellen Emerson. She's right here in Statesboro. She worked with me on cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget, she was sitting there one day, and she had this guide, in it, and I read the book on the side. It said, Mili U.S. Military Post-Traumatic Stress Manual. Uh -huh. I was like, God, I must be sick. He, she having to use the military guide on me. <laughs> but she did. That's what, it doesn't matter what the trauma is. Mm -hmm. You go through the steps of cognitive behavioral health therapy, but it worked. It worked. And I was ready to get well. Mm. And that work, that work was, came in my book. The, the journaling I did became the book. Oh. It was hard. Mm. She would tell me to keep a notebook of every time I would have a, a <gasps> moment. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that was all the time. Yeah. But I was, I was like, I was just determined I was going to make this work. And so I kept a journal. And basically what you do is you write down the incident. Mm -hmm. So it might be that I saw a man coming toward me in a grocery aisle. Mm -hmm. And it would. <gasps> and it would make me go, <gasps> that's him. Mm -hmm. But then what you do is you stop yourself and go, hold a sec. Hold a sec, gentlemen. What is this the reality? Is this real? Is that the truth? Mm -hmm. And then you make yourself go, no, that's not the truth. He's got his little boy with him, and they're pushing a grocery cart. Yeah. But, you know, you think that sounds sort of stupid and simple. But when your mind has these thoughts, you've got to unravel them. you got to back up. you got to make sure that you make yourself think every time, that's not real. Mm -hmm. And then the next step is you ask yourself, well, what is real? Mm -hmm. And you say, well, that's a man grocery shopping with his son. But you write down the effect it had on you, which typically mine was <gasps> mm -hmm. hyperventilation. And, you know, then you sort of like sweat a little bit. And then you sort of like, you know, paralyze. You get paralyzed. And then you go, no, that isn't what that is. Mm -hmm. I did it over and 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 over. Kept that notebook with me in the car. I kept it in my pocketbook. I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. Guess what? It works. Love that. It works. It, you know, this story is so powerful. Thank you. And, and not only because you were able to overcome, but you have come out of it just even more of an amazing person that you started. And, you know, one of the questions I would have is if somebody maybe in the audience is needing to hear something that they have gone through, yeah. that they've experienced, how would you encourage them? Because, it, to, to be honest, you are the person that has gone through that. It is. What would you say to them? I would say that you have to be open to getting help, right? There are so many um, different resources for people. 
Mm. But you have to be willing to let go of pride, Mm. let go of self Mm -hmm. to let somebody else help you. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's doctors, there's nurses, there's therapists, there's psychiatrists, psychologists, there's support groups, everything in all kinds of realms. You know, mine was a sexual assault and robbery, Mm -hmm. but many people go through other horrible obstacles in their life where they need counseling. Mm -hmm. And I think we resist it because, like in my case, I just kept thinking I was getting a little bit better, which I was, Mm -hmm. but not well enough. And um, I think the the message is that, you know, don't wait. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, and even if you think it's going to be painful, it's better than going through, like, I took the long road mm. to recovery. 20 years. 20 years, 20 years. I waited. Mm. I could have just shortened this so much, Adam, and gone on with my life in yeah. a different way. Yeah. But you know what? It's okay. I got there. I took a lot. I took some detours. Uh-huh. I mean, I was all over the place. <laughs> and so I just didn't. I'm not sure. It's not. It's sort of not like me because I do take care of business. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know. In those years, we were building funeral homes. We were raising children. We were busy, busy, busy being entrepreneurs. Sure. So there was not all. I want to. I don't want to paint the picture of sadness. Sure. I had great joy. Of course. But I had this conflict in me That's right. that was unresolved. That's right. But I finally got it all together, and it was through a lot of things. It was through counseling. I went to a psychologist. I went to Dr. Lickman, a psych- psychiatrist. Mm. I got on an antidepressant. I learned how to do yoga. I learned how to meditate. And I also found forgiveness. Mm. And I have some books. You know, I told you earlier I brought my books. Yes. The Bible, you know, I have a an NIV study guide. But one of the greatest things that happened in those years was I got close to God. Mm-hmm. I had to rely on Him mm-hmm. because nothing else was working. Nothing my family couldn't tell me any truths. Nobody could help me. At that time, I also wasn't to Ellen yet, mm-hmm. but God helped me. Mm-hmm. I stayed in his word, but I also, though, was stupid with the Bible because I had been raised like an Easter Sunday Baptist. Okay. Our family was not. <laughs> what does that even mean? Oh, my gosh. An Easter Sunday Baptist? Yeah. It's like we weren't there all year long, but yeah, we showed but up on Easter. Easter. <laughs> and like that. we were not. Mom and Daddy didn't have us in church. We left church uh-huh. at like when I was about nine, ten years old. Uh-huh. And we didn't go back yeah. until I was in my 20s. Okay. So I like was not really good with the Bible at all. Got you. So. The other book I brought for you to know, and this is like, okay, it's okay, but there's a book called The Complete Idiot's Guide to the Bible. Okay. Well, okay, so I kept these two going because if you don't know anything about the Bible and you are young in your faith and you're you're really immature in your faith as I was, Uh I was basically like a 28-year-old woman who was an Mm. 8-year-old. Spiritually. Spiritually. Mm -hmm. And so, but I was very... I got real, like, I knew uh, God had saved me. He did. He got me out of that room alive. And I made a promise to him that day that if he got me out of that room 939, that I would just go back to him. Mm Because I had left him as a young child, and I promised him that I'd make it for good. Mm. And so when I got out that Sunday, that Sunday after that Thursday night, I was in that um, pew of my church. Mm Mm-hmm. And I was looking at the preacher and just bawling my eyes out because I was so lost. And I just thought, okay, God, here I am. I'm a mess. Mm -hmm. I'm a mess. Mm. And so I kept trying to study the Bible and study the Bible and study the Bible and go to Bible studies. And it helped. It really helped. But I was still really, you know, pretty dumb about all of it. That's why I love that idiot's guide because I tell you what, it's the stories it tells. It's like, oh, that's what that is. (laughs) It's like, I didn't know. It breaks it down. It's like, Nehemiah who? (laughs) Obadiah who? (laughs) Who is that? So I'd get that book out like, oh, okay, I got the story now. Because this is hard. The Bible is hard to anybody who's not been in it their whole lives. That's right. It's extremely challenging. That's right. But anyway, but that was what I did. So I went... I got really close to the Lord, and he allowed me, in one of my chapters of my book, it is about the forgiveness Mm -hmm. of the man, the unknown man. Mm. But I forgave him Mm. because, see, a lot of that was still in me, too, the bitterness that comes. You know, like, why me? And I was mad with God for a long time. Mm. I mean, I just didn't understand. 
I didn't understand why God would allow this to happen. I didn't like God. I was like, why did you do this? Why did you allow this to happen? What have I done in my life to deserve this? Mm. Why me? Why me? Why me? Well, you know what, Adam? The fact of the matter is, right this second, if we went through this building, everybody's got something really hard going on in their Mm. lives. There's degrees of severity. Mm -hmm. None of us are going to have a life that's got the easy button. Mm. I wanted that easy button. Mm -hmm. We don't have it. Mm -hmm. Nobody tells us that growing up. Mm -hmm. They tell us life's going to be easy. Life's going to be fair. It's going to be simple. It's going to be charmed. It's going to be beautiful. It is not as a lie. Mm. Life's hard. Mm -hmm. All of us are going to face challenges. Maybe not as hard as mine, Mm. but you know that. You Mm. know that. The older you get, too, the more you know, oh, life isn't quite about as easy as I thought it was going to be. That's right. So I think it's just knowledge that it's going to be quite challenging at times. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of how are you going to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And so I think early on, I was young, I learned that you have to persevere. Yeah. That, because that, that, that challenge there is like, you know, it's terrible that that happened. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that you were able to come out on the other side of it. Yeah. And, you know, even all the positive that that is there now yes. covers that incident it is. completely it and is. i love that right mm-hmm. like cuz you know not to say that you know the the entrepreneur's journey has like you know these challenges that are even equivalent to that yeah. but the fact that you can take something that is that traumatic yeah. and turn it into something that blossoms yeah that is amazing and on that entrepreneurial journey i got to publish a book and, you know, when I did it, um, that, this was 2011 when I released it. This one's a little bit banged up because uh-huh. I used it so much. But there was something, again, entrepreneurism. I was the first, I was the first nonfiction writer to use QR codes. Were you? Ah! I put Q, this was before QR codes were even a thing. That is amazing. Do you know a guy named um, Chris Brogan by chance? Mm -mm. All right. Chris Brogan is still a thought leader in the world. Uh Chris Brogan had me on his podcast back in 2011. Okay. Because of my QR codes. Wow. And like, so it was, it was, it was like a, another dimension to the book where I hired, I had, oh, I had. I had award-winning producers, writers, musicians come alongside me and create music, create everything to try to evoke my emotions so that, you know, part of this is to let people heal, right? Yeah. And I felt like when I was writing it, I was like, yeah, this is flat. It's just on the paper. This isn't good enough. Mm. I'm going to create QR codes that tell it in a different way. And it's, um, but when I did those QR codes, I was like, that it was fun and publishing the book was fun mm. and promoting it was fun that's awesome and then going out and like just doing that whole promotional thing about it was phenomenal mm-hmm. for my career that's right like it was another it was my story but by that time i was accepting of where i was with it i was ready to tell the world mm-hmm. and i still speak nationally wow and i i'm you know not everybody can tell the story mm-hmm. Not everybody can get in front of an audience and talk about this. That's right. Well, you know what? God just said, guess what, Jenny Lynn? You're going to be the one. (laughs) I was the me too before me too even happened. That's exactly what I was. I I, I embraced it. I thought, no, I'm not going to be embarrassed by this. Mm -hmm. I was at the right place at the right time. Mm. I was where I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Some women have guilt because they think they were responsible. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's terrible. Mm-hmm. No woman, no woman should be sexually violated or be a crime statistic of sexual crimes. Mm-hmm. And we'll say that again. Men and women, no women or men should be a victim to sexual crime. Mm. And that is what this was. So I was lucky that I didn't have the guilt I was on a business trip. Mm -hmm. I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. Some women will say, well, you know, and they'll tell me, I think I had the wrong clothes on. Oh, jeez. And some people say, she asked for it. Oh, no. People have asked me, Adam, 
What were you wearing? No, they didn't. Of course they did. Yes. No. What were you wearing, Jenny Lynn? And I was like, well, I had a pair of black pumps on, pantyhose, a black and white skirt, and a black and white shirt that matched that skirt. I had on pearls, gold pearls. I had on my beautiful watch, my gold nugget watch that my parents had given me for graduation that he stole. It was the loveliest thing I'd ever had in my life. Mm. And that's what I was wearing. Mm. But women who are asked that, no woman, no woman should be violated. No. And that's something that I like to tell everybody, women and men, and men get sexually assaulted and raped too. Mm-hmm. Not at the rate that women do. Mm-hmm. One in five women will be sexually assaulted. One in five. No. In high school and middle school, one in nine. Wow. But often it's somebody who you know. Wow. Mine was a random act of violence. Mm-hmm. But statistics show us it's often, most often, someone you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I just am, I just feel like that thing was so bad. But at the end of the day, it's good. It's mm-hmm. good. It's good. I mean, I would, a lot of times I've tell young women, I did a conference a couple of weeks ago, and um, there was a middle school conference of girls, high school and middle school over in Effingham County. Mm-hmm. And um, I told them, I said, you know, I just don't want, I wish that wasn't my story. And I told them, I was like, sometimes I sort of imagine, what if I'd had the story that like, I was out in the ocean and, and a shark bit my leg off? Uh-huh. Like, could I be that? Sure. Like, because then you got like something to show. <laughs> And like they're like, Miss Jenlyn, that's so sick. I'm like, but it's true, though. Like, couldn't I have had like a leg bitten off or something? Did I have to have this happen? Because mm. rape and sexual assault, it's like, it's, it's different. Yeah. It's different. Mm-hmm. And so they were like, Miss Jenlyn, you didn't want to bite a, a shark bite, we don't think. I was like, I guess not. <laughs> but you do think weird things like that. Like, could it have been something else? Mm-hmm. But no, this was my lot in life. Mm. I was to tell this story. Maybe, maybe it was to help others. Yeah. So powerful. Yeah. So powerful. Yeah. I hope I'll continue. And I plan to continue. I'm never going to quit talking about it Mm -hmm. because I can do it in such a way where people feel comfortable talking to me. Sure. And they'll come to me and they'll say, Jenny Lynn, I've never told anybody this. Mm. Can I talk to you? Of course so. Mm -hmm. Tell me what happened. It's already happened to me. Mm -hmm. See, Mm -hmm. I give them... I give them validation that it's okay. Tell mm-hmm. me. It can't be anything worse than what happened to me in that room, mm-hmm. right? But it is worse. Mm-hmm. A lot of times it is worse. So there's degrees of, you know, um, degrees of severity of rapes and sexual assaults. But at the end of the day, I made it for good. Mm. And so in that entrepreneurism, I was doing consulting at that time. Mm-hmm. And Mark and I were doing funeral homes doing all that, doing all that. And then um, sec- second life quake happened many, many, many years later. And um, at that time, I had started my buzz marketing. Mm-hmm. <gasps> I had started in 2016 uh-huh. with my friend Alice Matthews. And she had been a dear friend of mine. And um, this time around with my buzz, I'm doing it alone because she's raising grandchildren. But um, my second life quake was in 2016. I learned that my husband and I were no longer going to have our marriage. Mm. Yeah. And so I wasn't expecting that. Mm -hmm. Mark and I had practically raised each other. Mm -hmm. And we had had a very wonderful marriage, wonderful partnership. And I'm not going to go into details, but Second Life Quake was our marriage shattered in 2016. Mm. And so there... I wasn't expecting that at the age of 55. Mm -hmm. And I had to sort of go, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So I couldn't stay with my business because as an entrepreneur, I just started it a year earlier. I wasn't secure enough. So I called several people, one of which was a woman at Georgia Southern, Jan Southern. And I said, Jan, um, I'll never forget. I was on the golf cart. And I was like, I got to talk to you about something. Mm. I knew her from Rotary. Not well, though. Mm -hmm. But I called her. I said, I'm um, going to go through a divorce soon. If you know of any PR or marketing jobs at Georgia Southern, I need one. Mm -hmm. Please keep your ears open for me. She said, Jillian, you don't believe this. 
I just posted a job for marketing manager today. Today? Today. Oh. <laughs> and so I was like, <gasps> I mean, I just knew it. I knew it. I knew it. But then you don't know what you don't know at Georgia Southern. Georgia Southern jobs are hard to get. Yeah, they are. They're there is a protocol. Mm -hmm. You don't get a job at Georgia Southern with friendships. Yeah, It is strict. You have many levels of interviews of people who don't know you. Mm -hmm. And so the the best will rise to the top. Mm -hmm. And if you're not the best for the job, you're not going to get that job. It doesn't matter who you know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you know the president of the United States, the president of Georgia Southern. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. That's not how it works there. Well, I got the job. I got the marketing manager job. Mm. And so, again, stability. I had to sort of get stable again. And, you know, it's hard after 32 years of marriage to be single and alone. But I did the Georgia Southern gig for four years. Uh And I learned so much. Structure again. Sure. That huge, you know, organization structure. And here I was, 55 years old. I was just like a sponge. Mm. And I was mature where... I sort of went into it like every day going, I'd go into the steps of Anderson Hall. I'd say, Lord, just help me be an instrument for you. Let me make people laugh and smile. Let me make people have a good day. Let me make it easy for people to do their jobs. Mm -hmm. Because at this point in time in my life, I had done consulting. And so from an outside consultant role, I, I knew that it could be easy. Mm-hmm. And you get into a, you know, Georgia Southern's a, you know, it's a ac- academics. It's very serious. Mm-hmm. So serious. I'd say, and people would say, well, Jenny Lynn, um, what do we need to do today? I was like, I don't know. Let's have some fun first. Uh-huh. What are we going to do? You know, let's have some fun. I was the probably the least serious of our whole 28 in, uh-huh. our, in our department. Uh-huh. But... It helped because people um, knew that there was joy in the journey. It's the energy. And like, why not? Let's just have fun. Mm. And then also, you know, a lot of times they'd say, well, you know, Jillian, this is how we do it. And um, this is how it's done. And I'd look. I'd say, okay. And then I'd walk out of the meetings, and then I wouldn't do it that way at all because I'm an entrepreneur. That's right. I hated the one thing I did. Everybody knows this at Georgia Southern because uh-huh. I left just this past year. Uh-huh. But you know, it's more like in a box. Yeah. And I'd always tell people, you know, y'all are all in this box. I was like, I'm out here, <laughs> and they knew it. Yeah. And but I loved it, and they let me be outside the box That's sometimes. Right. Yeah. Um, my, I love this story. Chris Camasholi was my director of brand and marketing. He's a super guy. But he used to say, Jenny Lim, you're over-delivering to the client. You uh-huh. know, we had all of our clients, all of our work was to serve the nine colleges of Georgia Southern University, the deans. Understood. Their, all of their departments, all of their program chairs, blah, blah, blah. Plus, we were to do the branding of the whole university. Uh-huh. It was a just a just Gi- huge, huge, ginormous job. But he would say, Jenny Lynn, you were over-serving. You were over-delivering. Not over so He said, you're over-delivering. And, and I'd say, I know, I know, <laughs> I know I am. And he'd say, don't do that. You're No, don't over-deliver. Uh-huh. You're over-delivering. Uh-huh. And I'd look at him, I'd say, okay, I'll try really hard not to. Uh-huh. And then I'd walk out of his office, and I would try really hard not to. But I am a consultant. Sure. And, like, I'm used to going in and over-delivering. Sure. But he did teach me a lot about not, you know, part of over-delivering is you don't have time to do everything you need to do. Mm-hmm. So I did learn much from him. Mm-hmm. And um, during those years at Georgia Southern, I grew because I'm wiser now. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't care anymore. Uh-huh. You know, I would run down the halls without any shoes on. Uh-huh. I would, I broke a lot of rules all the time in Anderson Hall. Yeah. I didn't care. Uh-huh. Like, what are they going to do? Uh-huh. And I would say to people like, they're like, Jillian, you're crazy. I'm like, I know. It's fun. <laughs> and, and like, I always have food in my office and just, you know, like, let's, if we're going to come to work each day, let's be joyful in it and have a good time. Mm. I mean, let's work hard. We worked hard. God, we worked hard. But it's like, if we're going to be here, we're going to have fun while we're doing it. That's right. And um, I, the department was wonderful that I worked in. And I just grew so much and I learned so much. It was like a, just a time of, of maturity where my brain was sort of catching up with some things. And I was just feeling like, oh, this ought to make sense. I don't yeah. think this made sense till I was in my 50s. Uh-huh. And then I decided just last year, and this is how you and I met. Mm-hmm. You and I met through my friend, Dewey, Dewey. Dimsdale. Mm-hmm. Okay. So... 
Here I'd been divorced you know, six years, and I had found and met Dewey Dimsdale. Mm, what an energy. He was awesome human being. Mm. He had lost his Carolyn, his wife, Mm -hmm. to cancer. Mm -hmm. I had lost my marriage, Mm -hmm. and I was set up with him on a blind date Mm -hmm. to go to a Georgia Southern football game. Yeah. I fell in love with him. Mm. And like, so last year, just last year, it hasn't even been a year, he and I had made, finally, we'd made plans Mm -hmm. last April, 12 months ago. He, and I've never even told you this, Adam, but he had said, and I had decided that we were going to join together somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what we were going to do yet, but I was going to have a roommate. Yeah. He was either going to move to Statesboro. I was going to start going down to Savannah. He was going to come to Statesboro some. He was going to start in the summer months. That's right. And so, you know, I was so excited. We just really were quite compatible. Yeah. He had been a public relations major at George mm-hmm. Southern. Boy, we had a lot in common. That's awesome. And so last May, he had come up to Statesboro for a um for a uh, round robin tennis tournament at the country club. It was hot that day, Adam. God, it must have been like 105 degrees. Mm. So we're playing tennis with like 10 other people and we played that morning like from 9 to 11:45 strong. Mm-hmm. We went back out. We all sat down for a few minutes, and then um, the coach said, hey, y'all want to do a few more minutes. Lunch isn't quite ready. We all get back on the tennis courts. We're like, "Ah, what the heck? We might as well play a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. And as I had told you the other day when we talked, you know, we're sitting there playing, and I'm playing against him at that point in time. And, um, you know, he suddenly just trips on the tennis court. And I was like, the minute he fell down, I thought, God, that's going to hurt. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just like a boom. Anyway, I look at him and I'm like, there's something wrong. Mm. There's something wrong. So we all knew something was wrong. He collapsed on the tennis court. We think that he had a heart attack. And as much as we tried to revive him, as much as all of us worked on him, everything, everything, CPR, Call the ambulance, CPR, CPR, CPR. He died that day. Mm. Life quake number three. Yeah. And Adam, I just, I didn't understand that one either. And there, oh, I missed one little detail here, though. The month before he was, you know, the month before he died, he and I had talked about me coming back to my buzz marketing. Mm. And he said, Jenny Lynn, you can do it. I'm going to be here to be your best cheerleader. Don't be scared to leave Georgia Southern and come back to your buzz marketing. I'm going to be here for you every step of the way. Mm -hmm. I had quit my job, Adam. Mm -hmm. I had resigned my position at Georgia Southern. Mm -hmm. And then Dewey dies. Oh, my gosh. What do you do? What do you do? Well, you cry a lot first. And I just went through a terrible grief period. But you know what? That survivor instinct hit not. It just comes back in again. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, you know, Jenna Lynn, you got to move. You got to make a living. You got to get yourself off the ground here and move forward. And I did what I'd done years earlier. I started putting calls into everybody I knew. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes you have to be humble. Adam, that's one great thing about entrepreneurs. Mm. You have to be honest enough and humble enough to say to the person the truth. And this was my truth. Mm -hmm. Number one, I quit my job at Georgia Southern a month ago because I fell in love and thought I was going to have the love of my life with me who supported me and would believe in me to do my buzz marketing. Mm -hmm. Number two, he just passed away. Can you help me? Mm -hmm. Have you got any work for me? Mm -hmm. I need to make a living. And I did it over and over again. I called everybody. Mm. You know what I did? I'm making a living again. Mm -hmm. It's been less than 12 months, and I have come back, and I'm not even doing what I had been doing six or seven years ago with Alice with Buzz. Mm -hmm. I'm doing, interestingly enough, God has, like, put it all together again for me to do straight PR. Mm -hmm. Not one person has called me to do marketing. Mm -hmm. Everybody who's called me has needed me to create content, to pitch media, Mm -hmm. I love media relations like no other, to work with journalists, 
just straight PR again. And that's what I've been doing for 11 months and just piece milling it together. And I'm talking about gigs. You know, you talk about the gig economy. I'm yeah. a gigger. I got gigs everywhere. I got a gig in Atlanta uh -huh. where I'm a part-time writer for Melissa Libyan Associates, which is a restaurant PR group. Mm -hmm. I got a gig up in Atlanta with another PR group. I got a gig over in South Carolina with a marketing PR group. I got my own gigs. I got, you know, I'm just putting it together. And that's what I've done. And it's okay. But again, obstacle, boy, opportunity mm -hmm. beyond measure. And I'm loving it again. Mm -hmm. And I'm not scared. Mm. I mean, I think fear has often been part of my journey. I've had things that happened that made me so scared. And I felt like there's this still this notion in me that I've not done what I was supposed to do. Because mm. like, I felt like my journey's been like I'd be going really well and then er, like this terrible quake. And it would pull me back like a, um, like, um, a tide. You know, sort of like a rip tide. Mm -hmm. My life has been, I've had some rip tides. And I, I, I'm 59, and there's so much more that I've got to do because mm. I've been pulled back so many times. I haven't, Adam, there's so much in my brain. I just can't, like, I, every day I wake up and I think, I just don't barely have time enough to, like, to, all these things popping out of my head and what I got to do, like you do, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I, like, can't contain myself because I have much to accomplish. And I'm not getting any younger. I'm, I'm 59. I got things to do. Mm. It's like, get out of my way. I got to accomplish some things. There's still a lot more to do with Room 939 with my speaking. Mm -hmm. COVID shut down speaking. Mm -hmm. You know that. That's right. And with my PR business now, I sort of like got some momentum going again. There's things happening with my business that I'm like, it's easier now that I'm older. Mm -hmm. It's easier. Mm -hmm. Like, people can come to me with these major issues. And I'm like... I didn't hard saw. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because mm. I'm 59. Like it's easier now than when I was in my 30s and 40s. The wisdom is allowing me to grow again mm -hmm. in exponentially. It's exciting. I still love it every day. Your tenacity and your strength is unparalleled. I don't know. I, about I, that. I think I. I mean, I. I see it. That's what I see. Yeah. Because. You know, for, for these challenges, which any one of these thing life quakes yeah. uh, to a certain extent could crush, could completely crush a person. Yeah. And the fact that you have been able to push through and then continue and not only see those things and see those things for what they are, but also bring light to them yeah that is just phenomenal like I, I I mean I think that that's something that every entrepreneur should realize is you know what what challenges are out, out, out there for you today that's right like what challenges are you facing that you know if Jenny can get off get off you know like and work through that what excuse do you have yeah that I think this is the best show that we've ever done <gasps> Oh, I can't believe that. Well, you know, I appreciate that. Mm. You know, I just, there's so much more to do, Adam. There mm. is. There's so, there's so much more. And I wish that I could just bottle it all up when people are having problems and just say, look, let me just pour a little bit of this on you. Yeah. You're going to be okay. Like, And I think maybe that's what I'm supposed to do is come alongside people and say, look, I know you think this is going to end your life. I know you think you can't get through this. I know you think that you cannot get this done. You don't have the wherewithal, the, you know, but people do. You just have to dig deep and you have to believe that you can persevere and that the that, that good can come of it. There's so much you, we can do so positively in the world and people need us where, where does that source come from for you i guess you, you you mentioned kind of like you know uh seeing the the strength of your mom yes right yes but if you were to try to bottle this yeah whatever this up like where do you think that 
you know, ability to say, no matter what, I'm still going to fight yeah. for my life. Yeah. I think it comes from just who I am. I am, I've always had childlike faith. Mm. I always believe that anything can happen. I've always been like that. Mm-hmm. I've been liked. When, before this assault, I was, um, my mother always described me as a butterfly, mm-hmm. flitting, carrying the nectar. And I just am like that naturally. Mm-hmm. I like joy and happiness. I'm carefree. I'm spontaneous. It can be very dangerous at times. <laughs> I'm sorry, but can. Like, <laughs> golly, it's just dangerous. It can be good and bad. Mm-hmm. I'm just telling you. Yeah. But spontaneous, carefree, um, like, I like, have childlike faith. I just love anything and everything that's new. And I love to travel. And I love to, to eat new things and go new places. And there's just so much to explore in the world. So why not? Why can't people have the view of the world like that? Mm. The world is a gorgeous, great place to live. So, like, why don't we have that? It's a, you know, PR is all about perception. Mm. How do I perceive the world? Well, I perceive the world as a good place. I perceive it as a place where I can go out and help others. I can go out and have passion with purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Why not? Why? Like, sometimes I'll meet somebody, I'll say, how are you doing? And they'll say, not bad. What the heck? Mm. I want to stop him and say, does that mean you're having a good day? And I usually do Uh because it's that perception. That's right. Not bad. That's right. I don't know where that comes from. Mm. Like, let's just be, let's make things happen. Mm -hmm. Like, I know know you got that in you, too. Mm -hmm. Like, you've got probably thousands of things you want to make happen. That's right. It's just like coming along with people who can do it with you. That's right. And like, have fun and make a, make a. Difference. Mm-hmm. I want to make a difference in people's lives. Mm-hmm. No lie. Like if I can help somebody recover, if I can help a client figure out a problem, mm-hmm. like I like to be a resource to people. I like to solve problems, mm-hmm. but doing so happily and, and having fun every day. Like, you know, like, I can't wait. I got so much to do, like, later today and tomorrow, uh-huh. and I can't wait to do them. I, I, another show, I'll tell you another project I'm working on. But that's another show. Okay. But, like, there's always some projects coming. You never know who you're going to meet. Mm-hmm. Have you ever thought about how many people you've met in this podcast? Mm-hmm. I'm amazed the people I meet, and I'm going, I can't believe I met you. Yeah. And, you you know, you end up collaborating with that person. You're like, is it all, is it? Is it all just, is it like this for everybody? It is. You know, the world is like this for everybody. It's just a matter of if you have it in your heart and in your soul to go for it. Mm -hmm. Like, let's explore the possibilities, not the impossibilities. Mm -hmm. Like, think about what you can do instead of what you can't do. Mm -hmm. It's a mindset. Mm -hmm. A mindset. Just get up in the morning and think, this world this is going to be a good day. And I t- I've, always, I've always awakened like that, thinking, I'm very excited about today. Even as a child, I was like that. And I'm like that every day today, too. Mm. Like, I can't wait to see what happens today. Yeah. And I expect, I expect it to happen. And you know what? The things, thoughts become things. Mm-hmm. What you expect will happen most definitely often will happen. Love that. Because it's called the law of attraction. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever read about it. I have. But it's so powerful. That's right. I use it all the time. That's right. And I I think it definitely works. That's right. And sometimes I do get in a pity party and I get my panties in a wad. Mm. My life isn't, you know, you can see, you know, this has been a lot of crying. Mm. I have a lot of wrinkles. Like when I came today, other than my push-up bra, I like really did a deal. I wish I'd had some Botox or something, but I've had a life of a lot of tears. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my life, my wrinkles show my journey. Mm. And I I like pretty things and I like to look my best. You know, there's only one chance. First, first, what's the, there's never a second chance for a first impression, Mm. right? That's right. And so, you know, I want to look nice. I want to feel good. But, you know, most of the time I wake up in the morning and I'm, I'm raring to go. Mm-hmm. Like, 
why can't people be like that, I wonder? What's so bad about the world? I, I, we have a good life. I think so. We're Americans. That's right. Entrepreneurs, you can do anything. That's right. Get an education. That's right. Think of some things. I got tons of things. Mm. I lo- I'd love to invent some things, too. Yeah. I am so excited. Yeah. I am so excited to see what the future holds for you. I can't wait. Because to me, I think, you know, the the all the story that you've told, uh, what I just see is the entrepreneur in you fighting every step of the way <laughs> to go out to achieve. Yeah. And so when you have that type of energy and the fact that you are doing it in this age of having all these challenges come come across your plate and you continuing on fearlessly yeah that is just hugely inspirational hugely inspirational i'm glad how do people keep keep in touch with you well i recently rebranded my website okay this was a good thing drop it jennylynanderson.com love that i rebranded it under the umbrella where Uh i would have my areas it's like it took a while to get here, but a great friend of mine, Hugh Darley, told me, Jenny Lynn, you don't need to do your Room 939 website anymore, uh-huh. your Buzz Marketing website, your Blank Blank website. He said, you're Jenny Lynn Anderson. Yes. Just put it all under one umbrella and then do your areas where you have your work, That's which right. is public relations strategy, content writing. Mm-hmm. I'm a national speaker. Mm-hmm. I sell a book. Mm-hmm. All in one place. All in one place. That's right. Ding dong. You think I'd know how to do that, but you know, you get so close to things, you can't see it. That's right. You can't see the forest for the trees. That's right. But I recently did it, but it's JennyLynnAnderson.com, and I'm right there, and I'm on, you know, I'm on all the social media channels as well. Awesome. And on another show, maybe in the future, I want to tell you about my travel, my becoming a travel blogger recently. Yes. But that's a whole nother story, and I don't know how long this show goes. That's right. We're, we're, We're closing on. Uh, the the time that we have today, but I'm Perfect. so look I'm looking forward to hearing about their your travel, uh, and then yes, you know I've said this multiple times, but absolutely inspired today, you I'm know glad. absolutely inspired today, and I think it's a message that although it comes from like you know a, a place of darkness. Yeah. The fact that again that you've can turn it into light, turn it into a positive, is just amazing like that's the only word i have for that thank so, you Adam. yes absolutely. i appreciate you and i appreciate you having me on today yes you I had are a blast. an awesome individual thank too. you thank you so much i yeah. appreciate that all right thank that's you. the show thank you